subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Thank you, Manthan. Thank you, Vikram, for thinking of me and Ajay for goading me on. I think uh, maybe for a couple of years now, he's been after me and I'm really very grateful. And to all of you, you're such a sophisticated audience that I am both intimidated and privileged to speak before you. So I will focus my talk on discussing what is young people's multi-dimensional situation uh, and are they on track to make a successful transition to adulthood. Uh, and then a, a bit on uh, what is the effect of COVID likely to be on young people's situation and on their needs. And finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about what are some promising practices, uh, interventions and programs that have a uh, whole promise for improving the situation of young people. A lot to cover. I won't cover all the dimensions, all the populations, uh, and I hope to give you a broad brush uh, synthesis of, of, what, of what we know and where we are going. Um, I'm sorry if you, some of you may find it superficial, uh, but there's a lot to cover. And I must also apologize. Uh, as uh, Ajay said, I'm a demographer. And uh, yes, you'll be seeing lots of numbers and graphs and uh, figures. But as a demographer, I don't know any other more powerful way to tell the story. So please bear with me. Okay, so let's start with the definition. The UN defines young people as those aged 10 to 24, and this encompasses those aged 10 to 19, called adolescents, and those aged 15 to 24, called youth. So this is basically the age group I'll be uh, focusing on, but also some indicators require or use um, uh, the age group up to 29, and I'll be, I'll be looking at that. So we all know, oh, uh, can I start? I, sorry, I've been talking, but I want to share my screen. Oh dear. Oh. Okay, sorry. So um, let's start with um, why it's important to that we don't fail our young people. Well, first of all, the magnitude of the population. We are now 370 million people. Uh, that's almost 30% uh, of India's population. And how India addresses the needs and rights of the young will determine their health and well being just now in their young ages, when they become adults, and in the well being and health of the next generation. There's enough evidence of that. A triple dividend is called a triple dividend. And then whether India achieves its own national commitments, whether it realizes its demographic dividend, whether it meets the rights of the young will depend on our investment uh, in young people. We have many programs. Uh, we need to exploit these. And so too, the SDGs. Uh, there are many SDGs that we will not attain unless we improve the situation of youth. Um, so let me start with a story of these two girls. I meet hundreds, maybe a thousand girl, uh, girls and boys during my work. And I thought I'd start with the story of these contrasting girls who I met in Jharkhand just a few years ago. They're both rural, they're both poor, uh, they both come from relatively similar homes. 
On your left is Ruchi. She's 12 years old. She lives in a remote village. Her home is tiny, kacha. Uh, there's no toilet, no water, no furniture. Things that you see uh, in many rural homes. Um, we sat outside, as you see, to talk. Ruchi told me that she's in class six. She's first in her class. She has huge aspirations. She wants to build rockets. She wants to explore space. She says she has many friends. Her mother is very supportive. I would say she's on track. She's got all the, she's equipped to um, make a successful transition. On your right, we have Preeti. She's 17. She too used to come first in class. She wanted to carry on to college, get a beard, become a teacher, but she was married off before she could finish class 10 when she was 16. Uh, and and uh, so now she lives with her in-laws and her husband. Um, now she says she has no dreams, no aspirations. She cooks and cleans. She's already lost one pregnancy. And from what she says, she's very anemic. Her in-laws are taunting her for not having a child. She hardly speaks in front of her uh, family members. She's afraid of her husband. She's beaten by him. And although she'd like to visit her parents, she's not allowed. Programs don't reach her. Uh, so at 17, I would say she is already off track. So my question is, will Ruchi turn into Preeti when she's 17? Or will Ruchi remain Ruchi when she's 20, when she's 50, an empowered woman? So put in a more academic way, here are six markers that define being on track, the minimum requirements of a successful transition to adulthood. I'm not going to read them, but I'll organize the talk around them. Um, to do so, to uh, make this presentation, I'll use various sources of data, national data where they're available, NFHS, uh, also the periodic labor force survey, state level data where national level data are not available, mainly the statewide surveys of adolescents and youth conducted by the Population Council in UP and Bihar and by Dasra in Jharkhand and other studies, um, some small studies as needed. So, just to show you the large number of policies and programs that relate to young people, uh, there are a whole lot. And uh, I said, my feeling is we're not exploiting them enough for young people. So let's start. On education, we've made many commitments, but are we poised to achieve them? Uh, on primary school and secondary school completion, there's good and bad news. The good news, as you see, uh, both over time, both for girls and boys, there's been a huge uh, change between 2005-06 and 2015-16. Looking on the right side of your screen, uh, completion of secondary school went from 30% to 52% among girls, from 40 to 60% among boys. Uh, this is definitely good news. But the bad news is we're very far from achieving universal secondary school completion. Uh, and at this rate, it's going to take us a while. And secondly, gender disparities, although they're narrowing, they're narrowing too slowly. And so you still see a big gap between uh, boys and girls. What's also worrying comes from the quality of our education and the level of learning outcomes among young people. Here are data from Jharkhand, where we use the ASAR questions to assess uh, literacy, general knowledge, and um, uh, numeracy. And so here we have the percent who could read a class two text, know that India, uh, Delhi is the capital of India, and know that Jharkhand is the state in which they live. Uh, let me take a moment to explain what these bars are. So the first bar is boys 10 to 14, then girls 10 to 14, boys uh, 15 to 21, 
girls 15 to 21 unmarried, girls 15 to 21 married. And uh, so what you see is that very small proportions, I mean, it's a small story, it's about a paragraph long, and to think that not 100% are able to read this story fluently, it says something about our system. Uh, just 73, 70% of unmarried older girls and boys, 50% among the married, 50% among young people, uh, 10 to 14 year olds. Knowledge about the, that Delhi is the capital of India, it's amazing that so few know this. And it's also amazing that not everyone knows that the state in which they reside is Jharkhand. And this is a, a finding repeated in other states as well. When we come to numeracy, uh, the first set of bars is uh, on solving a three-digit division problem. And again, you see that just half of uh, older boys, uh, the ones who are most likely to, uh, could do this compared to 40% uh, down to 26% of the other uh, four groups. So even doing a three-digit division is so difficult. Uh, adding money, yes, a lot more could do it, but it's still not universal. Not everyone can add uh, these four, uh, um, uh, money for, for five, 20, 100, 2000. And weights, calculating weights, something else all of them uh, need uh, is not happening. Not very few are aware of these things. Digital literacy. Uh, we talk a lot about digital literacy and um, a lot of our work is on um, uh, making at least one uh, person illiterate in every household. Yet we find there are, there are huge disparities in access to devices, access to the internet, which are clearly inhibiting many from uh, becoming illiterate. Um, if there's a phone in the house, it usually gets used by boys rather than girls. Many boys have their own phones. Very few girls have their own phones. Uh, boys access the internet, have social media access. Girls don't, and nor do they know how to use these things. Uh, then what happens in lockdown? So even without the pandemic, India was pretty far off track from achieving good school outcomes. I think COVID has set us further back. Of course, it set the world back. Uh, globally, more than one million students were out of school. And yes, with this shift of online schooling, um, we know it depends on uninterrupt uninterrupted net access and uh, access to devices. And again, falling back for these reasons is very likely among the poor, among girls, and so the gender disparities we saw are very likely to increase, and so too are economic disparities. Not being in school also means no midday meal, no school services, no weekly iron and folic acid supplementation, no sanitary napkin distribution, and of course, no interaction with friends. So important for, for schooling, school going students. What will happen when school reopens? There's a huge fear that many young people all over the world will, will drop out from school. The World Bank estimates that almost 7 million students could drop out due to pandemic shocks. And of course, girls will be more likely, the poor will be more likely. In India, uh, many um, youth, I mean, there isn't that much data, but youth serving organizations had been approached. Many youth serving organizations have been approached by at least one girl who says that uh, her parents are going to discontinue her from school. Uh, 
And we know premature uh, discontinuation from school means entry into work uh, and, and uh, early marriage. These things have been seen again and again. And of course, the 6% drop in the allocation to education is not going to help. So moving on to uh, talking about acquisition of livelihood skills and preparation for healthy school to work transition, our second marker, again, many promises, but what's the reality? Um, overall, I should say that India has one of the lowest female labor force rates in the country, in the world. Uh, and data from our own periodic labor force survey shows that labor force participation rates declined from 48 to 25 percent among women and much more mildly for men from 84 to 76 percent over the course of the, this century. Young people are the worst off. You see here just 16 percent of young women 15 to 29 are in the labor force compared to 59% of young men. And access to skilling, just 2% of young females and males had been exposed to a government livelihood training program. Many others may have attended um, private ones. There's now a concept that was started by ILO and now it's an SDG indicator called NEAT the percentage of youth 18 to 24 who are not in education, not employed and not in training. And what I've done is taken some ILO data and shown you the levels of need in um, many countries in our neighborhood. Uh, the first black bar is uh, the total population followed by boys, followed by girls. And if you see India down there, um, you see that for boys, it's fairly standard. They're falling within uh, something similar, 14%, something similar to Vietnam and Sri Lanka and so on. But for girls, 48% uh, are neat. And this proportion is only surpassed in our neighborhood by countries like Pakistan and Afghanistan. So 48% are neat. Why are so many girls neat? Uh, we already saw that they're not prepared. They're not qualified in terms of learning outcomes. They don't know about possibilities. But most of all, we live in this patriarchal system in which uh, going out for girls, getting a, a, a higher education, uh, going to work, is something that's totally looked down upon. So breaking away from norms is very difficult for girls. Uh, what might be the COVID effects? So here I'm using an article that was recently published in Scroll by Basile and Abraham that look at uh, the COVID effects on the labor force. They draw on CMIE data and they show that the young were most likely to have lost their job during or after lockdown. 59% of the of youth compared to, as you see, 40%, 35% of older uh, populations. And again, female workers fared far worse than male workers. Okay, so let's move to good health, physical, mental, and access to care. Uh, let me say that adolescence and youth are of a particularly healthy stage in the life cycle. And health conditions in this population are largely poverty, lifestyle, non-communicable uh, re diseases related, uh, and not infectious diseases. Number of policies and programs exist, as you see here, um, to address these. So first, let me show you the leading causes of death among adolescents and young adults, now 15 to 29. I'm just showing you the five leading ones. Uh, what you see are 
Uh, it's generally a similar picture, except for the very leading one. Uh, for girls at the bottom are maternal conditions leading. For boys on the top are transport accidents, motorcycles and so on. But the subsequent four are common for both. And you see, suicide is responsible for 13 to 14% of mortality in this age group, already showing the importance of mental health uh, issues in this age group. Then unintentional injuries, such as drowning, snake bite, fire, other accidents, and so on. Then the only communicable disease in this group, uh, tuberculosis, and finally, um, cardiovascular diseases. So we're already seeing cardiovascular diseases in, in this age group, symptoms of perhaps more lifestyle factors. And the health situation fairly reflects this mortality distribution. Uh, let me talk about some emerging health concerns. We saw suicide as the, among the leading causes of death. And here we see that uh, depression and suicidal thoughts are very prominent among the young. Um, so moderate to severe depression is reported by up to 2% of boys, 4% of girls, 7% of married girls. Suicidal thoughts by 3% of boys, 5% of girls, 9% of married girls. One in 20 unmarried girls, one in almost 10 of married girls has had suicidal thoughts. When it comes to substance misuse, alcohol and tobacco consumption are much higher among boys and girls, uh, about one quarter of boys and remember, these include 15-year-olds and 16-year-olds, and uh, up to 4% of girls, 4% uh, to 5% of married girls. So uh, alcohol and tobacco misuse are uh, quite prominent. And then, although it may not be emerging today, uh, HIV, I just want to share uh, the HIV rates with you. Uh, although you may say these are very small percentages, uh, they are a, a, a concern uh, because of the implications for, the own, for the, their own lives, uh, as well as for the pot a potential for transmission. And just to give you a comparison, for the overall population, HIV rates are about 0.23 to 0.25. So young people do have a lot of contribution to make there too. And then very quickly, let me talk about access to care. Access to care is limited. Uh, both frontline workers and something called adolescent friendly health clinics don't necessarily reach the young. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but just to say that although the NHM has talked, the National Health Mission has talked about um, frontline workers providing care, information, services to uh, adolescents. This is really not happening aside from pregnancy-related care, uh, nor are uh, adolescent-friendly health clinics, which exist in almost every district of the country. Uh, so then let's move to what might be the COVID effects. There's a global concern and more and more evidence emerging, emerging on the effects of, on mental health. Uh, globally, symptoms of anxiety and depression among youth have been noted in India. There's some evidence from early days of the lockdown that show that depressive symptoms increased compared to pre-lockdown. And there's also evidence of an increase in organizations being alerted uh, about a young person at risk of suicide. At the same time, as we all know frontline worker and uh, AFHC counselor responsibilities have shifted. Uh, they're all much more preoccupied, very justifiably so, um, by uh, COVID-related work. And there's, as a result, 
even less access uh, that young people have to them than before. So these are some of the effects on mental health and access to care. Now let us move uh, to a very sensitive topic about which uh, we Indians must keep uh, a much more open mind. Uh, informed, safe, and consensual entry into sexual relations, irrespective of marital status. Let me start by uh, discussing what young people know about growing up. Uh, in general, young people lack even basic knowledge about physical maturation, about pregnancy, uh, as you see here, over, just over a quarter of unmarried boys and girls and just half of, of married women know, uh, married girls know that a woman can get pregnant at first sex. Uh, few are told about any aspect of physical maturation, growing up, even menstruation before it happens can be a terrifying experience for many girls. Many girls have said that when it happened, they thought that they had cancer, for example. And what, it, what they're taught is just the do's and don'ts. Don't go in the kitchen, don't uh, go to the temple, don't make papa, don't do this, don't do that. They're not explained what is going on in their bodies. Comprehensive knowledge about HIV AIDS is limited, 15% among boys, three to 5% among girls. And uh, I think all these things are essential uh, as young people are growing up. And that's all not very surprising because sexuality education is so rarely received. In Jharkhand, for example, just 7% of boys, 26% of unmarried girls, 14% of married girls had um, received any sexuality education. And it's the same everywhere else, I think. Opposition is huge in this country to the provision of sexuality education. You may remember the uproar about 15 years ago on providing sexuality education in schools. At that time, teachers rebelled, even a Rajya Sabha committee was made to evolve a consensus on the implementation of this program. And the report of this uh, committee you, I think it should be still on the net, said that it has the potential to pollute young minds. I'm oh, sorry, I'm reading, I'm quoting, to pollute young and impressionable minds by exposing them to indecent materials. And so, so we teach sex education without critical information, providing them this relatively sanitized version of, um, uh, of education. And for those of us who have doubts even now about whether it's okay to talk about sexual matters with young people, uh, whether talking about will them uh, about it with them will have them running off to have sex. I think this is a myth. There's no evidence about it. On the contrary, there's evidence that it doesn't promote sexual activity. Uh, it actually makes sexual activity uh, more informed. More young people delay their first sexual encounter. When it happens, it tends to be safer. Uh, uh, more uh, young people use a condom. It reduces misinformation and it allows young people to say no when they don't want to. And the reality is that romantic and sexual relations before marriage is here to stay. Here are data from Bihar at two points in time. And you see there's an increase in both. Uh, let's focus on the bottom, premarital sexual relations. Uh, they went from 10% to 14% among boys, from three to six, uh, three to six percent among girls. You may say this is a small number, but it's one in seven uh, boys, one in 20 young girls. And if we don't make it safe for them, 
it will have dire consequences. So I'm showing you that because I'm, I'm not making any judgments, but I think this is the reality we must accept. But what to me is very disturbing is what's on the right side of your screen. Of those who are premaritally sexually active, 30% of boys, 5% of girls said they had sex with more than one partner. Um, and then when we come to non-consensual sex, uh, unwanted sexual overtures and forced sex. We are inundated uh, with news about these issues. Now, most recently, we've been talking about skin-to-skin -skin justification uh, for what might be called uh, a sexual assault. And we hear daily about horrendous rapes that have taken place. But here are data uh, showing what's happening at state level and, uh, in Bihar. A non-contact sexual harassment, that means verbal teasing, staring, stalking, all those things, are experienced by 22% of these young girls, 10 to 14, and 19% of boys say they have perpetrated it. You may think this is nothing very dangerous, but already we know that many young girls get traumatized with just these incidents and several girls have dropped out of school because of this kind of harassment. As far as non-consensual sexual touch is concerned, uh, about 10% of girls have experienced it, that is touch on their private parts without their consent. Uh, even boys are reporting it. And then coming to forced sex, uh, about one in 20 girls has experienced it. One in 20 boys say they have perpetrated it. These are very worrying numbers. And of course, very few of those who experience any of these things have sought help. Uh, turning now to uh, delays uh, uh, in marriage, childbearing, consent issues, and uh, uh, marital life. Uh, let's start with child marriage. Child marriage is a, a clear violation of country laws, and we see here that it persists. Uh, let me take a minute um, to sh tell you what these lines are. I'm using NFHS data from the 1990s to 2015-16. Uh, the green line is for India on the whole, the red lines is are for rural India and the blue line for uh, urban India. And what we see is that really between 1992 and 2005-06, there was a decline in child marriage. Child marriage is marriage below age 18. But this decline was very slow from 54 to 47% in uh, uh, 15 years. Then there was a quite a sharp decline, 20 percentage points from 47 to 27 percent between 2005-6 to 2015-16. So that is good news that the trend uh, has declined in that in that time period. But still, more than one in four girls is marrying as a child. And what's also disturbing is what's happened since. NFHS 5 has taken place in, a, in some states, the phase one states. And for many of the states for whom data are available, uh, we are seeing stagnation. So in the four years since 2015-16, there seems to be some stagnation in these high uh, child marriage states. So that's worrying. Uh, also very disturbing is the lack of voice in marriage decisions. Well over half of married girls in these three states met their husband for the very first time, the red bars, on the wedding occasion. 57% to 77%. And many girls say that their marriage had been arranged and they had no choice in the matter. 
basically even those who say they had a choice in the matter have acquiesced. Uh, they may have been shown a photograph and they just said, okay. Uh, that's the trend in, in, under the, uh, in a patriarchal setting. Uh, on the right, I'm not gonna read it, but uh, some quotes from a girl and a mother from rural Rajasthan just last year. You can see the girl was going to acquiesce. You can see that the mother thinks that um, uh, this is her right. This is the right of parents to decide on the uh, marriage of their children. And then over the last year, there have been two disturbing things that have happened that have further limited uh, girls' rights. The first was the task force, uh, uh, the sudden proposal by the prime minister to raise the minimum legal age at marriage for girls from 18 to 21. 18 is pretty established worldwide as the uh, legal age at marriage. Uh, and reasons that they provided uh, were lowering the maternal mortality, improving nutrition levels, providing opportunities for further education, uh, empowering girls and so on. There's no evidence for this. In fact, whatever evidence is suggested uh, suggests that uh, raising the age at marriage will not do this, will not reach, uh, accomplish these uh, very lofty, very worthwhile goals. Uh, we believe the task force report has now been completed, but it hasn't been released. Uh, and then we have the infamous Love Jihad legislation. I don't need to talk much about it, uh, but just to say that this is one more way in which parents whose children exercise their own will can use the law to penalize them. Not to say that this was not happening earlier as well, but now, of course, there's a communal twist to it and a justification because it's a law. That's also very disturbing. Moving on to children having children, fertility starts very young for many young girls, 8% uh, for India as a whole, as much as 18 and 19% uh, in West Bengal and Tripura. So in other words, uh, one in 12 girls is having a birth before she's 18 uh, and almost one in five in West Bengal and Tripura. Uh, I should say that uh, childbearing before age 18 is considered the most unsafe, most dangerous time uh, for, for a female to, give, uh, to be pregnant. And this is particularly so uh, in a country like ours where anemia is so prevalent. Um, so we're seeing that children are bearing children. Um, and at the same time, we're seeing that pregnancy below age 18, although most unsafe, uh, very few, uh, sorry, many, uh, girls are no doubt uh, delivering in an institution and getting uh, postpartum care, but it still means that about 20% of girls uh, who are giving birth in these very um, unsafe conditions uh, are not delivering, they're delivering at home, and 30% uh, are not getting care in the crucial six weeks after delivery. Contraceptive use is generally lower among young people than among uh, the adult population. And that you would expect because many young people may want to uh, have a child as soon as possible after marriage. But actually, this is not necessarily so. Many young, women, uh, young couples don't want to have a child immediately after marriage and but they don't have the means, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the access to uh, methods, 
They don't have the access to services. All our service providers think that young people should have a birth as soon as possible after marriage. And so uh, they're not reached. Uh, newlyweds are not reached. And so as a result, 22% of young women have an unmet need for contraception. That means they want to delay a pregnancy, but don't practice contraception compared to 13% of older women. And then within marriage, sexual violence persists. Here are data from Bihar and UP, 30 to 37% of uh, young women reported sexual violence perpetrated by their husband, 27 to 28% reported physical violence. And what do young people say, what do young women say when we ask them, well, what do you do about it? What can you do about it? They say, there's nothing we can do, we must tolerate. And if it's really bad, we can always jump in front of a train. That is the extent to which young people, young women in particular, are powerless. Uh, COVID effects on child marriage. Uh, uh, it looks like the gains we made might be threatened. Globally, an estimated additional 13 million child marriages may happen. In India, researchers have noted that any crisis or natural disaster that uh, has an impact on household poverty tends to be uh, associated with a spurt in child marriage. And this is very likely here. And already we're seeing uh, this in call data to uh, Childline and other helplines. What about effects on childbearing? Uh, on the left, I show global effects. On the right, I show what's available for India. Globally, it's estimated there'll be ma many more maternal deaths. Many more women will be denied contraception, and this will result uh, in thousands, if not millions, of unintended pregnancies, additional unsafe uh, abortions, and so on. And pandemic-related violence against women and girls has been so widespreadly reported across the globe that UN Women has called it a shadow pandemic. In India, it's estimated that during 2020, 25.6 uh, million women uh, were unable to access contraceptives. 2.4 million unintended pregnancies took, uh, took place. More youth serving organizations have been approached by a girl in need of abortion. One study observed a 45% decline in institutional deliveries uh, and reported that one third of pregnant women had inadequate antenatal care. And of course, there have been more calls to helplines uh, uh, reporting um, um, spurts in violence, domestic violence, cyber bullying, and so on. Only yesterday, there was an article in the paper about it. And uh, you may all remember uh, the boys' locker room incident that happened earlier on in the lockdown. Finally, we come to uh, empowerment. Our last and perhaps all pervading marker of a successful transition to adulthood. We have so many programs, you see many of them listed here, that are intended to build agency, develop leadership, counter patriarchal norms, change attitudes towards young people. Uh, but uh, I don't know if they have been as effectively exploited as they may have been. The data we have come from uh, these surveys in Bihar and UP, where uniform questions were asked on young people's participation in decision-making matters affecting their own lives, sort of like um, um, decisions on spending pocket money or decisions on friends, schooling, those kind of basic things. Mobility, the freedom of movement to move around unescorted uh, to a, a friend in the neighborhood, uh, uh, to attend a health, uh, to attend a program, and so on. Uh, 
uh, and uh, the ownership and uh, operation of their own bank account. Many school students now have bank accounts. And what you see in both these states uh, is that uh, these indicators of agency have not reached 100% or not even close to 100%, although uh, the adolescents are, uh, it's in late adolescence, 15 to 19. Uh, and what else you see is the, the, the considerable gender gap, whether it's looking at um, uh, decision making, whether we're looking at mobility, almost every boy has freedom of movement. Uh, less than half of girls do, uh, unmarried girls, uh, very few unmarried girls do, reflecting their um, isolation. And operating their own bank account, yes, many more do, but again, we're seeing however narrow uh, a gender gap. And lastly, coming to gender role attitudes. Uh, young people are no doubt bucking the deeply entrenched patriarchal norms of their parents. Uh, what you see here are just some basic uh, attitudes that were posed to, to uh, uh, young people in these surveys. Do you think girls should be allowed to decide when they marry? Uh, what do you think, uh, should men be the sole decision maker on spending household money? Uh, can a, should a girl get beaten if she uh, stays out late? Should a woman be beaten if she doesn't obey her husband? Yes, you'll see that uh, almost on every indicator, the majority, that's over 50%, have egalitarian um, views. But not all of them do. So a lot of them still hold very patriarchal views. Um, and, and that is a major concern. Okay, so now let's come back to where we started. Are we failing our young people? Given the situation that we've seen, will Ruchi, the empowered 12 year old, turn into Preeti at age 17? Or will she remain the empowered uh, 12 year old when she is uh, 20 and 30 and so on? Um, I think on balance, we've made a lot of advances in many of these areas. And many Ruchis will become, uh, will remain Ruchis in their uh, adulthood, will experience a successful transition to adulthood. But too many Ruchis will turn into Preetis. And this is the, the worry that all of us in this field have. So let's end on a more hopeful note. What are some evidence-based leads for investment? I know that uh, evidence of what works, what might work uh, is, uh, is, is limited. Um, but here are some leads. Uh, many of these leads refer to education. Uh, and the first, which has been seen to work in India, actually by, in a study by Abhijit Banerjee and colleagues, supplementary coaching for disadvantaged students and first-time learners does enhance learning outcomes. Uh, using local young women and men as coaches, it's a cost-effective way of dealing with schooling outcomes. Uh, so too, of course, do scholarships and vouchers. The bicycle scheme for secondary school girls that was started in Bihar had very positive results. Uh, and then second are uh, conditional cash transfer programs. They've been uh, very successful in many parts of the world. Uh, these consist of providing special incentives for regular school uh, attendance and for reaching milestones like secondary school completion um, by age 18 without marrying and even completion of college. And precedents do exist. In fact, there's a statewide program in West Bengal called the Kanyashri program that is um, uh, providing 
conditional cash transfers. Third, skill pro skilling programs must be comprehensive. There's no point in providing just a vocational um, skill. Uh, what we must provide uh, are soft skills training, career counseling, job search support, job related mentoring, etc. And the evidence, again, not uh, completely from India, but including from India, has shown where uh, these are implemented, employment and monthly earnings went up. So did delayed marriage and childbearing. Then fourth are comprehensive sexuality education programs. These are a must. I've spoken a lot about them already. Uh, and these must include accurate, uh, age appropriate knowledge, as well as a human rights approach, informed uh, uh, decision making, ability to answer young people's questions, co communication, negotiation, breaking down traditional norms, developing critical thinking, and so on. This is all part of comprehensive sexuality education and found to be quite successful in many countries. Fifth, we know that many young people are out of school and so non-formal community-based gender transformative programs are needed to convey these same life skills that we saw for uh, school-going adolescents adapted for, for the, uh, the community. Um, these haven't been very uh, often um, uh, evaluated, but what has been evaluated, including in India, uh, show that there's a huge promise in them. And sixth, in this country where over a quarter are still marrying in childhood and many are marrying uh, in adolescence, we need focus programs for the married girls that build their own empowerment and improve their outcomes. They won't attend programs for open for everyone. And so we must develop programs that are geared towards them. And finally, programs to engage parents and communities. We must change patriarchal norms. We must develop positive and 21st century child rearing practices among them. So that's a rather long agenda. Uh, and uh, we're all working towards it. So let me end now with this to thank you and end with this quote from the report of the Lancet Commission. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope I haven't gone over your time. Yeah, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shirin. That was, a, I mean, I, I, I'm seeing the chat here and I'll just read out a few things. Uh, Sangamitra says very Wait well. Minute, let me take some notes. Yeah, yeah, very well researched and very informative. Uh, Shailaja says uh, one of the one minute. It's uh, a robust and all encompassing presentation backed by data and insights. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Sujana says. Data presented raises a lot of concerns about our young, especially our girls. Finally, I'll just quote one thing. Sophie Ahmed says, what an excellent speaker with so much knowledge of data collection that she so willingly shares with us. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you have uh, uh, thousands of uh, volumes of data which you have not yet shared and we'll be glad to share that. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah. And, and and our friend Justice okay. Madan Lokur sends me a message saying that Shirin's presentation was remarkable. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was Shirin. You. It was thank you so very much. Thank you, this, friends. So mm -hmm. Shirin, uh, you've raised many many questions uh, <laughs> along the data which you raised, uh, which you presented to us, and uh, I would start by just asking you the question on child marriage which you also wrote about recently, uh, saying that does the uh, change in legislation of raising the child marriage really alter uh, maternal mortality and uh, nutritional values? Can you just elaborate on that and what you think? 
great pleasure. Um, so on the issue of maternal mortality, we have global evidence, and I think nobody would contest that, that the most dangerous time to, for a pregnancy is below age 17, 17, 16. So below age 18, you can say is a very dangerous time. After that, until about 2024, 20, uh, even during the 20s, is the safest time for a pregnancy. So by, by denying girls uh, the right to become pregnant between 18 and 21, we're actually denying them the right to be pregnant at what is probably the most safe years. And then to say that it will allow them to, uh, uh, there's no doubt that those uh, who marry later have better education, um, they're more empowered and so on. But why is that? It's because they've come from much better off families. Their nutrition is better because they've come from much better off families. Mary uh, John has written extensively on this and she's very clearly shown that raising a, a, a marriage age from 18 to 21 will have no effect on these things if you just isolate that effect. What will have an effect is improving the situation of young people, giving them uh, those kinds of um, um, opportunities. Yeah, this uh... and and one more thing. So while you saw that twenty seven percent of young women are marrying below age eighteen, uh, over sixty percent are marrying below age twenty one. So, do you think that just by a law we're going to change the norms of three in five or more families with child uh, with girls? who are of marriageable age. Is this a feasible thing when we haven't even been able to do it for age 18? Okay. I'll leave you with that question. It, it fuddles me and I'm sure it fuddles all of you. I'm part of a foundation where we work the child line. Uh, and I find that to be hugely effective in our line of work to prevent child marriages. Uh, the, and I think that this gap seriously exists that the children must have access to empowerment. I mean, they must have access to uh, a system which could prevent, which will empower them to prevent child marriages. Do you think the government should invest more in such infrastructure like Childline? Oh, definitely. Uh, Childline is doing uh, really amazing work. But I think we have to think about prevention. And actually, the government, as you saw in all those logos, has many programs, many programs for the young. Uh, many of them, even the, the RKSK program, the Raj Kishore Swast Karikram, uh, has opportunities to create groups of young people at village level, uh, at urban level, to, uh, to provide a kind of uh, empowerment curriculum and activities. So the structure exists, the platforms exist, but to what extent are they being uh, uh, really used in a positive way? They're not. We've done some research uh, through the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, which is showing that we're, we're, not, we're not exploiting them. We have, we have these programs in many states but um, we're not necessarily um, using that as a platform for empowerment. That's true. Uh, Meera Shinoy works uh, immensely on, uh, on the disabled. So she's asking a question. Uh, have you done any study on the youth with disabilities in, the line with, in line with the gender work that you've done? Uh, it, you know, Mira, I, I knew somebody was going to say, you haven't addressed the disabled, you haven't addressed same-sex relationships, and there are many dimensions of youth uh, that I, I am unable, uh, was unable in this 
presentation to address. And I apologize for that. Uh, no, I don't myself, since I do these statewide surveys, uh, I think what we need are dedicated surveys of the disabled. And uh, I have not seen that, unfortunately. We have actually in a small study we did, the one I just told you uh, about, that's looking at the RK escape program. We did ask whether uh, the disabled were uh, specifically involved as members of the groups that had been formed. And uh, we found that very few uh, groups did include them. So yes, they are a particularly excluded group among, among even the most vulnerable. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Sharad Kumar uh, asked the question, world over the cases of depression and suicide are increasing among the teenagers. How do India's numbers compare with the world average? And what sort of distribution have you observed? And I'm adding a rider to that. Do you think that there is also a strong correlation between this and increasing dependence on social media? Okay, now you're asking me very tough questions <laughs> that I don't know the answer to. Mm -hmm. How does it compare with other countries? Um, I don't know. I would imagine looking at but our data and seeing... Sorry? How is, is it increasing in India itself, if not compared to the world? Uh, I don't know um, the extent to which we have data to show that. I would assume that it has increased over time. If we look at, for example, mortality data, we do see that there has been an increase over time. I'm not very sure, but uh, I, I would assume that. Uh, I think um, Dr. Dandona uh, in PHFI has done a lot of work on mental health issues in general, and uh, her work would be the most authoritative on this. On your question, Ajay, about the social media, I'm sure the social media is having an effect uh, so far, we don't have that much data on that. Uh, but you saw the extent to which married girls are uh, much more likely to have suicidal thoughts than the unmarried, even among girls. Uh, and I think that's really telling us something uh, nationally about both child marriage and mental health. Um, about your question, I would think that, that it's certainly affecting mental health matters uh, from what we see in, in the press, but I'm not aware of any studies that have looked at social media. I'm sorry, but my guess would be that you're right. So one question that is asked by more than one uh, from the audience is, how do you change the existing patriarchy in the mindsets of people? What, what can be done to change that? At uh, least three people have asked that question. Yeah, million dollar question. I'm also asking it. Uh, those seven uh, promising interventions, all of those uh, are, are trying to dent in some way these traditional notions of masculinity and femininity. We haven't yet really uh, latched on to work on, on parenting, on community gatekeepers. And I think much more work needs to be done. You know, we've focused on the young, but a young girl may be empowered not to get married before 18 or not to allow others to decide who she marries. But when it happens, she acquiesces, even the better educated, even those who have gone through our programs. So, so I think on the one hand, 
we must address girls, we must address boys. For too long, our focus has been only on girls. And we know that boys play an important part, both in enhancing their risks as well as facilitating their empowerment. And we need to work on that. But we also need to work on ourselves, the parents, the communities, all of whom have these traditional um, uh, misgivings. And so uh, all of those seven outcome um, interventions that I listed are very promising and have shown ways of chipping away at the you know, patriarchal norms. Uh, Ajay, or to answer your question, I'll give you a Next time when you come home, make sure that I answer the question, not my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, that doesn't sound good. I'm, I'm not being patriarchal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> here, uh, uh, on, on the data you presented, Sangamitra asked this question. Uh, is the pattern which you presented same? You Do you think it will be similar all over India, quite similar to Jharkhand? Um. Well, it's certainly similar in Bihar, UP, and I would think Rajasthan and other northern states as well. You know, we did in 2006-07 um, a sub-national study of young people, rather on the lines of these three surveys, in six states of India, including Andhra and Tamil Nadu. Uh, in many ways, they were similar, but in those areas of agency, child marriage in particular, uh, Tamil Nadu uh, is very different. Tamil Nadu has very low child marriage rates. Uh, Andhra, oh sorry, that was undivided Andhra at that time, had very high rates that compared uh, with the northern states. So, so yes, in many ways they are similar, uh, but in many ways they are very unique. And so um, I must admit that what I'm looking at and the data I presented really focus much more on uh, the lesser developed states of our country and not those which are less patriarchal, such as let's say Tamil Nadu, Kerala and so on. Um, Thank you, Sangamitra. I should have clarified that. Yeah. Uh, Brian Papali is, uh, Papali is saying, uh, the answer is evident, but it's worth reading. Evidence-based investments as shared by Dr. Shireen is way better than lofty goals or laws like raising the legal marriage age for children. How can, oh, we, yes. collect how can we collectively change it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Brian. <laughs> I think we only have people who think like us and not the other side here. But um, I think, you know, platforms exist. And if you read the documents, the RKSK document, for example, um, and other, um, the uh, scheme for adolescent girls, which I noticed has now been merged into something else and into and looks like the a lot, uh, allocation has declined for it. But the, all of these do have very strong goals. I mean, strong ideas about empowerment. Uh, others are showing education. The education policy uh, 2020 is, is a really very interesting, very forward looking document. So, you know, we have the documents, we have the platforms, but they're all under-resourced and nobody's paying attention to them. So all those seven things, I think, can be uh, well used uh, by uh, applying those in those platforms. But we need a lot more um, support at government level. A lot of NGOs are working on these things uh, and doing really great work. But until the government uh, supports and cooperates, we really don't have much um, leeway. 
So coming uh, to the government, uh, Shireen, one question that uh, comes up often in discussions is, what role would government have in, let's say, achieving universal education or in making these fundamental uh, systemic changes in society and their you know, whole approach to that? Uh, should it be only government which should be doing it or uh, is there a role for non-government actions? Well, as I just said, uh, these government programs and policies do have the very interesting documents. They do say all the right things. It's a question of how they've been implemented. They have been implemented. The same things have been implemented at small scale by a lot of other organizations. The country is full of youth serving organizations that are doing all of these things, um, uh, whether it's universal education or whether it's the systemic changes uh, in society that you're talking about. There are many uh, small examples, but now it's time to go to scale. And we can't go to scale without huge government support both in terms of gaining access, as well as, of course, in terms of financial support. And that, I think, has not been happening to the extent that we would need. There's a very, the, the, another raging debate this is on job-oriented skills. And uh, uh, I have Sujana asking a question. Uh, job-oriented skilling for girls is surely a better proposition but uh, its viability is always a concern. How shall we go about it? And maybe region-wise approaches may help. Again, I have a rider here. Uh, at what age do you think that, the, that we should start working on vocational skills to children? I'm from the school of thought that uh, children must avoid vocational skills not before till, till they're 14. See, I think the, the new education policy is actually thinking of uh, amalgamating vocational skilling, uh, at least perhaps at secondary school level, with uh, the academic stream, trying to make it less uh, stigmatized to go into vocational skilling. Um, and uh, I, I completely agree with the point about job-oriented skills. Uh, I had to cut this out of my presentation, but we've done work where uh, uh, girls, who, uh, when we ask girls and boys who uh, have had skilling uh, 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 programs, who've taken skilling programs, what they were trained in, it's the typical gendered skilling activity. Girls want to do tailoring. 80% of girls did tailoring, want to do tailoring. The boys are much more distributed. Most, yes, will want to do computers, but a lot of them are doing mechanical work, electrical work, and so on. Why can't girls do these things? So girls are not doing or interested in or encouraged to do skilling uh, in market-oriented skills. Uh, yesterday, I was looking at the skills mission report, which has a lot of pictures. All the pictures are of men. So it looks like our focus is almost entirely uh, male oriented. And I think the attitude is, well, uh, girls are not allowed to do these things that involve mixing with men. The survey that I was talking about in Rajasthan, we asked girls uh, whether they would accept a job working in hospitality. Very few said yes. And mothers were completely scandalized. Very few mothers would allow their daughters to work in hospitality where they have to serve men, where they may have to interact with men. That was something. So market-oriented skills are not only not uh, aspired to by girls, but there are blockages wherever you look. Uh, and where these blockages have been overcome, Girls are doing very well and are the role models in their villages. So uh, I don't know if I've answered your question, 
but i think job oriented skilling along with the soft skills the uh, job support the job mentoring activities there was a study i think it was in north india of um of uh, uh providing bpo skills to to young girls <clears throat> and this study showed that when these um, facilitators would go to villages and uh, uh recruit girls who were interested in taking bpo skills and the uh, bpo jobs and then match them with available positions a lot of girls were able to uh, take on that position they became role models they married later and it looks like the data are also showing that not only did they marry later but they've kind of changed the norm in their community yeah so this is an article by jensen in 2012 i think which is very interesting in terms of the potential of course he was dealing with those um who had completed class 10 or class 12 but nevertheless it did change norms uh someone's asking do you have any insight or uh, data on workplace harassment of youth uh -uh. <clears throat> not necessarily of youth but yeah the mostly young people i don't personally but many years ago i ran a uh a uh, fellowship program and one of our fellows paramita choudhury from uh, from west bengal did a very interesting study on um on uh, harassment in the in the health sector and found the extent to which women they were probably mostly young women uh, were harassed in the workplace and the consequences that they faced in um in terms of their job many of them left many of them asked for transfers and so on. but there was no legal recourse for many of them okay i have a last question uh, and this is a something which we have been living for the past 20 years i would guess that india is to reap its demographic dividend and uh, Riya Thakur asked a question. We have talked about reaping India's democratic demographic opportunity. Clearly, we are very far unless the government invests in adolescents, uh, and we will lose this opportunity. Is it a much hyped uh, opportunity, or is it a problem? Uh, thank you for asking that question. Well, it's not hyped enough, I think. Uh, we know we're talking about demographic dividend as if only the numbers matter yes we are at this wonderful stage in our demographic transition where we have more uh, people at work uh, at working productive ages than uh, at younger and older ages but that doesn't mean anything if those people are not qualified not trained not educated don't have the skills uh it doesn't mean much and so we are really standing to lose the advantage of our demographic dividend unless we we move really fast because that window will close it's already closing in or closed in the south it will close uh in the next 30 40 years in the north as well uh i'll ask the last question um Shireen, and this is from Ranjan Cha. Uh, Ranjan is saying thanks for an extremely effective and thought-provoking presentation. While governments and NGOs are doing what they can, do you have any examples of effective programs that corporates or educational institutions have driven to help change the environment? This might spur some thinking in uh, concerned people in the audience. Ah. Uh. Uh, look this is not my area uh, but uh, an organization i work very closely with dasra does have a network of corporates and others and they would be much better equipped to answer sorry ranjit <laughs>